You know, we have introduced Sunday morning and, of course, on social networks that we're going to be studying the book of Acts. So if you will, open your Bible to the book of Acts. And, uh, you know, I mentioned today that, you know, come and, and, and enjoy the exciting adventure of the book of Acts. I have read this book over and over and over, and it never gets old. It never gets old. Because it's the actions, listen to this, if I want to write this down, the book of Acts, and the old King James Version says Acts of the Apostles, and that's true. But there's a deeper theme in the book of Acts, it's the Acts of the Holy Ghost. It's the Acts of God the Holy Ghost through His new born-again church. And uh, it is amazing. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's one of the most misunderstood uh, the most misconstrued, twisted, perverted uh, things people, I, I've seen people do everything to the book of Acts to make it fit their theology. Listen to me carefully. How many wants to be the kind of Christian that God's called us to be? Amen. That God's word says we should be? Amen. I've seen people twist stuff here in the book of Acts and, and, and just make it say something that it don't say. And of course, in my style of teaching, and, and I like to think preaching, you know, I prove everything with the Word of God. I let the Word of God speak for itself. Because listen, uh, I'm a spiritual gift too, like one of the apostles. But listen to this. The same Holy Ghost that used them uses me. I don't use Him. He uses me. Amen. They didn't use Him. So you can understand this book. The apostles didn't use the Holy Ghost. He used the apostles. Amen. And let me tell you something that will help straighten out a lot of bent and twisted theology. The Holy Ghost won't do anything you want him to do. But he demands you do everything he wants you to do. And if you don't obey the Holy Spirit, guess what? You've quenched the Spirit of God. Amen. Now, who... Who did, did God in his wisdom choose uh, to pen uh, this fascinating, adventurous, exciting, wonderful uh, story of the early church? The Holy Ghost choose Luke, the physician. How many knew that? The same Luke that wrote one of the Gospels is the author of the book of Acts. And here's another interesting point that I want to make before we get started. It's believed by the historians and the theologians that uh, St. Luke, or I call him an Apostle Luke, uh, he had the privilege of writing with Mary, the mother of Jesus. Are you listening to me? I'm not saying Mary wrote any of the book of Acts. I'm saying she was alive and he was with her uh, during the time he wrote this epistle. And I don't know about y'all, but that's exciting to me. You know, can you imagine... Uh, having the Holy Spirit impress upon you things to share about God uh, and His Word and then have the very mother of Jesus. He said, Brother Harris, you, you sound kind of Catholic. Well, let me tell you something. I don't believe in praying to Mary and I don't worship Mary. I make no petition through Mary. But I understand that Mary is the mother of my Lord Jesus Christ. And she was a godly, godly woman. Uh, she was a woman that moved in the spirit, that knew how to uh, be so discreet and so dignified that God chose her to raise his son. Now think about that. Acts of the Apostles, there's 106 verses in this book. The writer again is Luke, the beloved physician. The analysis of the book, or the main theme, is the missionary campaigns in the early church. And you know, if you really want to be the real deal when it comes to Christianity, if you want to truly uh, imitate the first century church, whichever denomination, even, even the Catholic church claims that that's their root, okay? Every Christian organization says, you know, the first century church, uh, the Pentecostal church, and the book of Acts, that's where we come from. Well, it is where we come from. It's where every true born-again Christian comes from. And that's, again, why it's so important 
that you understand God in a relationship by the born again experience. Because if you're not born again, you've not become spiritual. Am I making sense to you? Only by being born again can men see the things of the kingdom of God. Remember Jesus said that. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot perceive the kingdom of God. He cannot understand the things of the kingdom of God. Because that which is spirit is spirit. Can I get a witness? The Bible teaches over and over and that which is carnal is carnal and enmity with God. So it takes a spiritual being, first of all, to truly understand the Word of God. If you're trying to read and study the Bible and you've not become a born-again Christian, and, go, and I'll say a born-again Christian, if you hadn't at least taken that step, that first step, you can read the Bible all you want and it's just going to be mumbo-jumbo and you'll never be able to interpret the, the, the heart of God. Now, you can read the letter of the law, but the letter of law, what does it, it do? It kills but it's the Spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. Let's all say the Spirit. Spirit. Say it again. The Spirit, Spirit maketh alive. The letter killeth, but the Spirit maketh alive. I can almost picture in my mind the physician Luke, who had become a born-again Christian and sanctified, and Luke had went on and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he has the privilege of being able to, I'm going to call it, hang out uh, with some of the apostles. And his most important blessing, I believe, to help us understand uh, the Son of God was Mary, the mother of Christ. Listen to what uh, Luke says. He says, The former Tracy have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. What is this former tressy? It's, a, it's the former letter, the former book. It's the book of St. Luke. He says, I wrote that of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. All that Jesus began both to do, to do, get that, and teach. And of course, we believe here is strong evidence that he had access to, the, uh, to Mary, the mother of Christ. He said... I wrote of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Watch this. Until the day in which he was taken up. Now we know to have all that inside information, he had to be uh, in company with the apostles and Mary, the mother of Christ. If you don't believe me, read first and second chapters of St. Luke. Amen. He describes uh, Mary and Joseph and the birth of Christ better than any other author of the whole Bible. Now listen to this. Uh, he said, I had access to information of all things that Jesus did and taught until he was taken up, until he was taken up. After that, and watch this, after that he, after he was taken up, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Now right there proves everything I just said. Listen to me carefully. It's so important for every born-again Christian to move on in the faith and obedience to the Word of God and receive the fullness of the Spirit. You say, Pastor Harris, what do you mean by the fullness of the Spirit? I mean receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Notice in this first chapter, Jesus, He wants everybody in the world to know what He did can I get a witness? <laughs> and the things he taught, but before he releases them to go out to the world and share the good news uh, of salvation, he wants them to tarry in Jerusalem until they're endued with power from on high. Now listen to me, folks. Listen to me carefully. Amen. Being baptized in the Holy Ghost, having the fullness of the Spirit, is a commandment of God through Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. And it's good to be born again. That's the, the, beginning, into the be, beginning entrance into the kingdom of God. But I want you to understand that's not all that pertains to our salvation. 
Can I get a witness? All right. I think we got enough Bible under our belt to say a prayer. Holy Father, we come to you one more time. God, we ask you to anoint your word, anoint me, your humble servant. God, to teach your word. Heavenly Father, I yield and submit myself to the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I pray for the eyes and ears and mind and heart of every person under the, under the sound of my voice. God, to uh, be anointed to, to receive the truth, to hear the truth, to know the truth, God. Heavenly Father, I certainly rebuke around the world, God, ignorance and misunderstanding about the truth of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God, as we study the entire book of Acts, every Wednesday night, I pray, God, that you will help me, Lord, to communicate to your people on earth that are called and chosen, the elect, to understand, God, the moving of God the Holy Ghost. And the church said amen. Hallelujah. The apostle... Luke said, St. Luke said, whichever way you want to refer to it, the physician, Dr. Luke, hallelujah. He said, God anointed me and revealed unto me everything about the life, death, burial, and resurrection. Notice this, even the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, that means after his death, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them, watch this, 40 days. Remember in the book of John, I told you that after Jesus was resurrected, he showed himself to his disciples many, many times. We know at least four times to the 12. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you. Hallelujah. And notice now, Luke gives revelation in the book of Acts that Jesus just didn't show himself alive to the apostles, but to many members of his church. Think about that. Many members of the church knew that Jesus was alive and well and that he had a glorified body. And of course, we're fixing to read that at least the minimum was 120 of them. 120 of them. But I've got biblical proof that there was as many as 500 that saw him after his resurrection from the dead. And we'll get into that as we study the scripture. Look in verse 3. Jesus, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. i got to stop right here just a moment. He refers to his death, his brutal death, as his passion, as his passion, as his desire, as his love, as his heartbeat. And I'll tell you why. It's because through dying on the cross uh, for our sins, please God. He knew that his sacrifice was well acceptable to the Father in heaven. And the Holy Spirit refers to Jesus' sacrificial death as his passion. By many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Lord, have mercy. Talk about days you'd like to go back and be able to be there in the crowd. This is one of those moments when I would have loved to have been uh, among the closest disciples of the Lord the 40 days after his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension back into heaven. Can you imagine the joy and the excitement, even the fear, I'm talking about in a godly way, that they must have experienced being in their homes, uh, walking down the street, and all of a sudden, Jesus just walks right up beside you and he's glorified body and he shares to you the things that pertains to the kingdom of God. Now notice here, by the words and mission, that Jesus has got things he wants to share with those in his kingdom, with those of us that are his disciples. So the book of Acts, hallelujah, is going to give revelation to any true disciple that loves the Lord with all their heart. We're going to learn things about the kingdom that Jesus 
shared with them and they will share with us. And look in verse 4, and being assembled together with them, on an occasion Jesus being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Watch this. But wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. Now, this promise of the Father is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It would be a time in the future. The Old Testament prophets proclaimed when mortal men would receive the power of God, not just on them, but in them. In the Old Testament, many times, over and over. I mean, the list is, is so long that I, I couldn't even exhaust it uh, in a night sermon. The list is so long of, of times and moments when God the Holy Ghost, the third person of the triune Godhead, fell upon men and they did extraordinary things. Let me say it this way. The mighty power of the Holy Ghost fell upon ordinary men and those ordinary men under the power of the Holy Ghost, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, done extraordinary things. For example, tonight, let me give you a good one that we're all familiar with. How about little David as he stood upon the top of the hill with a trembling, fearful Israeli army? And what made them so afraid is they were looking down into the Kidron Valley, and there stood at least a nine foot to 14 foot tall giant. Are you listening to me? That was cussing Israel and, and, and reviling the God of Israel. Little David, possibly uh, as young as 14 years of old, couldn't have been older than 16 years of old. The Holy Spirit moved upon him because he did have a devout relationship with God. And David shook himself, ran out there and looked at that giant and turned to Israel and says, who is this heathen, this Philistine that's cursing our God? Why don't somebody go out there and kill him? And men began to make excuses why they didn't want to go out and face this giant. But because David had the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon him, listen to me carefully, David said, God uh, in, in times past has, has moved upon me by his spirit and I've took my bare hands and I've slew lions. When the anointing of God has come upon me, I have chased down bears and killed them. The same God that anointed me to kill the lions and the bears, he will anoint me to go out here and fight this giant Goliath. Can I get a witness? You know the story how that Israel, uh, King Saul, the message was brought to him and all of Israel gathered around David as, as he tried to put on the armor of Saul. And of course Saul was one of the tallest men in all Israel and David was just a boy. The armor was just was clumbersome upon the little boy David. And David made a, 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 an act of wisdom under the Holy Ghost, and he looked at King Saul not to offend him, but spoke with a word of knowledge. He said, I've not proved these in war, but the God that gave me favor over the lion and the bear, he will be with me as I go against this Philistine. Listen to me, brothers and sisters, little David, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, walked out of the camp of Israel. He walked off the hillside, crossed the Kid Run Brook, picked up five smooth stones. Hallelujah. This is hard not to teach. I'm wanting to preach. Hallelujah. He, he felt those stones and they felt just right. And he was anointed by the Holy Ghost. He dropped them in his shepherd's bag and he went on out to face uh, the, the giant Goliath. Are you with me tonight? Hallelujah. When Goliath looked and saw David coming out upon the battlefield, he knew that he was just a boy. And I'm going to paraphrase this. Goliath, he said, what have y'all done? Y'all sent a little kid out here to me. I'll tear him apart like a chicken. I'll rip him apart like he's nothing. And David pointed his finger at and that old Philistine, that heathen, that enemy of God in Israel, that enemy of the church, that type of Old Testament Satan, David said, 
I don't come after you with a spear or sword, but I come after you today in the name of the Lord. And David began to run and attack the giant. Are you listening to me? He had nothing but a shepherd's sling and a stone in it. He began to twirl that shepherd's sling. And I don't know about y'all, but I've got an understanding that the anointing came upon David. I believe that sling became uh, making a sound like a helicopter. Hallelujah. But anyway, when David... David slung it. It went straight into the forehead of the giant and the giant dropped dead that day on the valley floor and Israel gained the victory. Listen to me carefully. If the anointing of the Holy Ghost can make ordinary men extraordinary, how much more can the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God do with ordinary people if He comes to live within us? Somebody give God a hand clap. Hallelujah! Listen to me carefully. I don't care where you go to church. I don't care what your preacher has told you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for every believer with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I'm going to prove this in this study of the book of Acts. Well, hang around and see. The Spirit of God will prove that it's His will that He live within you and manifest Himself First, by you speaking in other languages as the Spirit gives utterance. We stop and think about other men of old that when the anointing of the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were able to do things that's naturally impossible. How many remembers the story of Samson? Amen. Amen. I don't know if you picture Samson as an ordinary man or as a man that looks like a WWC wrestler, or WE, I'm not sure what you call it, but whether Samson looked like a a, a professional wrestler, or whether he looked like a normal human being, we know that when the anointing of the Holy Ghost would move upon him, he could do extraordinary things. Somebody say amen. I'm here to tell you, Ten regular guys could take down any boxer or wrestler that's walking and breathing today. Listen to me carefully. When the anointing of God came upon Samson, Samson was able to pick the jawbone of a donkey up and kill a thousand Philistine soldiers. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. Under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, when the Spirit of God would come upon Samson in the Old Testament, he was able to run up to the gates of a city. The gates of a city. Are you listening to me? And run off with the gates of the city and carry the gates of an ancient city all the way up to the top of a hill. And the fear of God would come upon men that knew about Samson because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I say again, how much more powerful and effectual can born again Christians be if we have the Old Testament anointing dwelling within our temples? Hallelujah. You know, I beg, I beg you to open your eyes and hard to understand the truth about this baptism of the Holy Ghost. Jesus notes here that it's so important that this baptism must first be received before you dare leave Jerusalem. Now remember, He had already prepared them and commissioned them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Can I get a witness? I said, can I get a witness? Is that not the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. Was for his church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is our commission. That is our commandment. That is our order. But notice here we are not qualified. Hallelujah. To take on such a monumental task, a monument task uh, until we have tarried in Jerusalem uh, until the church uh, has received uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5 says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost 
not many days hence. Let's establish a fact. There's a difference between water baptism and the baptism in the Holy Ghost. That's two different experiences, two different acts of obedience to the believer. They are not the same. I've heard many try to argue that baptism of the Holy Ghost means the water baptism. Or when you're water baptized, you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is not true. That is not factual. That just is not true. Jesus said, John truly baptized with water. Listen to this. But ye, but ye shall, but ye shall, but ye shall. That don't mean anybody left behind. Somebody say amen. That means every one of you. That means every person in my church, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days from here. When they therefore were come together, watch this, they asked of him saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, he, the disciples are asking Jesus, will you break the Roman yoke off of Israel? Will you restore Israel as a nation as it was in the days of David and in the days of King Solomon? Now listen to what Christ says. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. The restoration of Israel as a nation is a date and a time that Father God reserves unto himself. Somebody say amen. It accompanies secret information as the day the Lord will rapture the church. Woo! I don't know about y'all. I don't know about y'all, but I, I get a little revelation here. Hallelujah. Amen. And of course, we know it won't happen until after the rapture of the church. Jesus said, forget about the restoration of Israel. He knew, he knew that it would be at least millenniums in the future. But what was important then in that day and in that moment is that they had power to be his witness. That they were anointed to go forth and be successful in ministry. Jesus said, but ye shall receive power. But ye shall receive power. But ye shall receive power. Hallelujah. He said, but ye shall receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Notice here. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, uh, what comes along with it, what accompanies the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it is power. Hallelujah. Power for what? Power to serve the Lord. Power to, to bring your body under submission to the teachings of the Word of God. Power, hallelujah, over all the enemy. Power over Satan. Power over sickness. Power over sin. Power over death. Somebody say glory. I feel this in my soul. Power to be my witness. Power to preach the gospel. Power to be an evangelist. Power to be a Sunday school teacher. Amen. Power to be a believer in the next two millennium. Power. Jesus said, you need power. You need this baptismal power to represent me well and to build my kingdom. Brothers and sisters, do you understand that Jesus ascended into heaven at the right hand of the Father. Ephesians 4 says, when he ascended up on high, he gave gifts unto men. Hallelujah. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ until we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God. Somebody say amen. Until the church is matured. Hallelujah. In the fullness of Christ. Every Christian of every generation, especially our generation, needs this power. We need this power, that this baptism of Christ. We need this to happen in our lives. It truly will give you power. Power to have wisdom when you need it. Power to have knowledge about your future. Somebody say amen. Power to know about the things of God. But ye shall receive power after that. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Watch this. The Holy Ghost in baptismal form had not been received by the apostles. When Jesus breathed on the apostles 
uh, in that room and told them to receive the Holy Spirit, he was simply sanctifying them and preparing them for a day for the days ahead. And now we have come in the book of Acts chapter one to those days ahead. Now watch this. The red in your Bible means Jesus literally spoke these words. But ye shall receive power after, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had thus spoken these things, while they beheld, watch this, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall, shall, shall so come, hallelujah, in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in and went into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas and the brother of James. Watch this. These all continued with one accord and supplication with the women. With the women. I'm saying that because some teach that only the 12 apostles received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues. That is not true. That is false. That is not the truth. It wasn't just the 12 in the upper room. We notice it was the 12 and the women that followed Jesus in his ministry. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? And not only the women, but and Mary, and Mary the mother of Jesus, (laughs) <laughs> with his brethren. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. We see there, here that the resurrection of Jesus Christ finally convinced uh, his natural family to believe in him. Somebody say amen. Did Jesus' family ever believe in him? I've heard many say, well, Jesus' own family members uh, didn't believe in him. The truth of it is, after his resurrection, they all believed in him because it's documented right here in the pages of God's holy word. I thought somebody would shout. Somebody give God a hand clap. Give your Lord a hand clap. And now we're receiving revelation that most people, even in Christianity, don't understand. All you got to do is go read their doctrine. Hallelujah. But listen to this. Listen to this. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there in the upper room waiting for the promise of the Father, which Jesus also promised, His disciples, it was Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, watch this, watch this, it's not 12. Watch this, the number of names together were about 120. There it is, there it is. Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was God to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us. I would ask you to highlight this, underline this, earmark this, because it's very important information as you begin to establish doctrine. Notice here that Judas was numbered with us and had obtained get it, had obtained part of this ministry. Now folks, that's heavy. Now folks, that's important. To those that teach that Judas was a devil all all the time, all along, that's not true. Judas was handpicked by Jesus to be an apostle. Are you hearing me? Hallelujah. 
Judas was also breathed upon and blessed by the Lord to preach the gospel. He preached the gospel. He cast out devils. Somebody say amen. He healed the sick. He ministered with Jesus three and a half years. But notice that Judas, who had obtained part of the ministry, and watch this, not just any part of the ministry, but one of the 12. Have you got that? Have you got that? He obtained part of this ministry. Now the Bible explains to us what happened to Judas and the blood money. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong he burst asunder in the mist and all of his bowels bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem insomuch that the field is called in the proper tongue a seldom, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate. Now listen, this is not saying that Judas went out and bought a field and his guts run out. Judas hung himself. Are you listening to me? I said Judas hung himself. Let me go ahead and tell you the whole story. Judas allowed Satan to enter him. He sold the master for filthy lucre. He become guilty and would not repent and committed suicide. And the filthy money, the blood money that he sold Jesus for, a man took the money because it was not legal to put it, put it back in the Jewish treasury, it being blood money, they had to do something with it. So they sent a man with this blood money to buy a field to bury the dead. And the Bible says that the anointing of the Holy Spirit, are you listening to me, struck this man dead because he touched the money that Judas sold God's son for and our Savior for. It's not good to backslide on God. And it ain't good, and it ain't good to hang out with backsliders. Amen. Somebody say amen. Judas Iscariot is a fallen apostle. That's the truth. That's the facts. That's what the scripture evidence. It can't be denied. It's the truth. Amen. Judas fell from grace. Judas turned his back on the Lord. So they had to choose one of the number of the disciples, watch this, that had accompanied with the twelve all the time that Jesus went out and, and in and among them. Watch the scripture bear this out. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let Judas' habitation be desolate, let no man dwell therein, and let his bishopric, there it is, his bishopric, let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have company with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Beginning from the baptism of John. Watch this. This was the requirement to be in the number of the 12. It had to be an eyewitness. Beginning with the baptism of John. Do y'all get that? Until the same day that he was taken up from us. Woo! That's, that's some stiff stiff regulations to fulfill Judas's place. It had to be somebody that saw Jesus baptized in the Jordan River and be with Jesus and know about Jesus. Watch this. Until the very day he was taken up from them into heaven. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us here it is, of his resurrection. Of his resurrection. Of his resurrection. I don't know about so, but every time I read that word resurrection and it's associated with Jesus Christ, it makes me want to jump. It makes me want to shout. It makes me want to be happy. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. I want to tell the world that Jesus is alive. He is not dead. He is alive and well at the right hand of the Father and he's soon coming back for his church. I said he's soon coming back for his church. I said he's soon coming back for his church. Shandana Bahia. This living Christ 
this living Savior who is alive and well at the right hand of God our Father is soon to come and rapture His church. Woo! I tell you what, this is hard to teach. Makes me want to preach it. When you look at the world news every day, the Middle East is on fire. Are you listening to me? The Middle East is on fire. Israel is surrounded completely by enemies. Think about that. Think about that. Israel tonight is as good as, and as well said, completely on their own. As Iran is within 20 yards of scoring a touchdown for a nuclear weapon. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what kind of world our world would be with Iran and a nuclear weapon? I'm sorry, folks, but if you threaten to annihilate America and Israel, if you actually threaten as a national leader the elimination of two nations without weapons, (laughs) my God, What will our world look like when Iran gets those weapons? Folks, we're living, listen to me, we're living in the last days. I feel that in my soul. Hallelujah. It's just something in the air. There's something in my spirit. There's just something in my soul. Hallelujah. When I see the Bible being fulfilled every day on the world news, I know that the coming of my Lord is at hand. And that same power, and that same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that he's fixing the gift of the disciples, hallelujah, that same power lives in me. So I know that when he comes out of heaven like lightning, and he gives that command, the power of the Holy Ghost that's within me is gonna quicken my mortal body. I'm gonna lose gravity and fly to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall I ever be with the Lord, hallelujah. You better make sure that you've got all the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit that you can get so you'll be ready when Jesus comes. This is some of the most beautiful of all the scripture. In verse 23, and they, watch this, and they appointed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord. They prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men. Let's don't forget now, let's don't forget. Verse 2 has already taught us that a new thing has started to happen in the kingdom of God. Since Jesus has got back to his throne, he reveals things, he reveals things to his apostles, he reveals things to his church through the Holy Ghost. I said through the Holy Ghost. Verse two says through the Holy Ghost. Jesus commands his disciples. Jesus commands his churches. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. I say this with a broken heart. I say it with love and humility. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit and you're trying to pass for church or have church, get down on your knees and ask Jesus to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire before you attempt to serve him anymore. I know that may hurt a lot of folks' feelings, but it's the truth. And I know that a lot of folks likes to go to these big cathedral churches and they want to hear somebody telling them a sweet little story about how to make them feel better about their self and little sermons that imply that Regardless of how you live, what you do, what you say, how you, how you act, God's lo- God, God still loves you. Well, he does love you. God loves everybody so much, he died for you. Amen. My question tonight is not, does God love you? Does God like you? 
Does God like you? I know he loves you, but does he like you? Are you obeying his commandments? Are you living your life pleasing to him? Or is the relationship you have with Jesus one that you bend it to where he fits with what you want to do? Folks, that's no relationship at all. That's no relationship at all. They chose to. Ask the Lord to show them which man was best qualified to be numbered with the eleven. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Notice here, the call of God to preach the gospel must be the call of God. You can't call yourself. Mama can't call you. Grandma can't call you. Listen to me. Before you get up behind a pulpit and before you dare to speak in the name of God, you better make one thing sure. And that's the calling and the election of God. And the apostles wanted to make sure. They wanted to make sure that the slot from which Judas fell would be filled Watch this, with the very man in heart that Jesus chose. And here's why. That he may take part of this ministry. And here it is, and apostleship. Let's all say ministry. Let's try it again. Ministry and apostleship. From which Judas, here it is, from which Judas by transgression fell. Well, let me read that again. Did it say he fell? Amen. Through transgression? Amen. From being an apostle? Amen. It does. Folks, it does. So that the other, tell us, Lord, who you choose, so that the other might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots. And the lot fell upon Matthias. Here it is, folks. Here it is. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. He said, Brother Harris, what should I take away from this first chapter in our continual study of the book of Acts? You should never forget what Jesus said in verses 4, 5, 7, and 8. I close with this command from Jesus to the believers. He said, do not depart from Jerusalem. Wait, wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. The promise my Father made to the Old Testament prophets. Jesus said, I also promised you the same thing. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Watch this. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Catch this, catch this. But ye, but ye shall. But ye shall receive power. After. Not before. Not now. But after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be my witness. Now watch this. The word witness in the Greek can also be interpreted in the English as the word martyr. I know you know what a martyr is. It's what Allah's fanatics are so proud to be. But Jesus said this power I will give you to serve me It will be a power that will drive you and sustain you even if you have to lay down your life for my name's sake. Remember I told you that there was a grace to die? Here it is. No Christian should ever fear of being put in a spot or a situation where your life will be taken away because you're a Christian. I know of missionaries that have died for the name of Christ. Listen to me carefully. 
Listen to me carefully. And I'll prove this as we get on in the book of Acts. There is a grace to die. There is a grace to die. Here we dig deep and we find it. Jesus said, I'm gonna give you power to be my witnesses, to be my servants, to be my church, to represent me on earth, even to the point of giving your life for my name's sake. Let me ask you something. Those of you that don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, would you really, truly die for Jesus? You know, that's easy to spit that out of your mouth. It's easy for us to say, oh, I died for Jesus. Would you really? Now, would you really? I know you can. I know you would. I know you could without fear if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. The night I was attacked in my home, I fought for my life. But are you listening to me? I never feared where I would spend eternity. Listen to me carefully. I've been there. I've been there and faced death this close. This close. I faced death. Some people talk about it. I've lived it. And I was attacked for my faith. Come to find out, come to find out the guy hated me because I was a minister of the gospel. I can tell you when you're faced with death as a spirit-filled believer, you won't be afraid to die. And I'll tell you something else. You'll have the power to fight. You'll have the power to fight like you've never dreamed possible. I don't know about you, but many, many years ago, as quick as I possibly could, as quick as I read the book of Acts and really understood it, I didn't reject it, this power of the baptism, this anointing of the Spirit. I ran to it. And can I tell you, other than my experience of being born again, other than being born again, which was my first step anyway into the kingdom, other than being born again, Receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Pentecostal style. Acts style is the best thing that will ever, ever, ever happen to you.